Hey everyone, so uh, I recently recorded a video on the Central Limit Theorem. And I talked about the Central Limit Theorem and uh, explained what it is. Long story short, the Central Limit Theorem says that sums of IID random variables start to behave like normally distributed random variables, regardless of their initial distribution. And if I were in a physical classroom, as I would like to be, uh, I would show my students um, a demonstration that the central limit theorem is true. And I mean, it's nice to see computer demonstrations. We've seen computer demonstrations that the central limit theorem is true. But the thing is about a computer demonstration is that it's still on a computer. And there's a, there's a little bit of not realness to computers, right? Like, like video games happen on our computers and video games are not real, all right? So it would be nice to see in the real world that the central limit theorem is true. It's nice to see real world evidence that the central limit theorem is true, which uh, I, I went on this uh, long diatribe about um, in another aside video about how actually rather difficult it is to define probability and pin down a rigorous definition of probability. And that said, despite all those issues, I said, at the end of the day, it feels like probability is a real thing. Right, We're, regardless of how you define it and all the difficulties in defining it, there is something real that is being described by probability. And there's real world evidence that probability is a real thing, whatever its definition. And uh, one way I like to uh, demonstrate the central limit theorem and show uh, w what it does and what it says and show that it is in fact a real thing is a Galton board. So I have a Galton board. I picked this thing up. It was $50. <laughs> These things are expensive. Like, okay, you could get a $10 one and it's a piece of crap. Uh, you, if you want a good Galton board, you got to pay for it to in order to get something that's been engineered properly. Because if you don't engineer it right, then you, it doesn't work. So I have a Galton board. And the Galton board is a demonstration of the central limit theorem amongst other things. And I'm going to talk about what those other things are. But uh, here's kind of the idea of a Galton board. All right, we got uh, beads. And beads are going to come down out of this funnel. The, I think this Galton board has uh, 2,000 beads. And it's going to travel down rows of pegs. There's 12 rows of pegs for this board. Uh, whenever a bead hits a peg, it can either go to the left or it can go to the right. It can go in one of those two directions. And... Each time it goes down a row, supposedly, or at least hopefully, whether it goes left in the top row and then goes right in the bottom row is independent. Whatever movements it makes as it goes down the board should be independent of previous movements. Okay, so it travels down the board. It's a series of random movements to the left and to the right, and then eventually it hits some bins. And, as it, and then after it hits the bins, it will go down a bin because it can't travel to the left or right or more, and then it will fall into a slot. And we then look at where the beads end up in the slots to get a sense of, um, well, where they're going to end up, where, where, where this uh, process is they're going to go. And, well, uh, let's go ahead and uh, open this board up. Uh, so we got a nice little handout that's very nice. And then we've got... Uh, the actual board itself and uh, let's see so what we would do is we would need to tip this board back to reset see everything going back to where they were notice here that we got a triangle uh, with little hexes in it and those tri and that triangle actually has numbers in it um, the numbers in the triangle well first off the triangle is the uh, what is it I have a nice name for it darn it Oh yeah, Pascal's triangle. It's Pascal's triangle. And if you're familiar with anything from mathematics. And they even record things like, okay, so this side says that the triangle is uh, Pascal's triangle. It's got, uh, it, it shows how Pascal's triangle is related to the Fibonacci numbers. By the way, that formula N choose K uh, that, I've, that we've seen before, like uh, 3 choose 2, 5 choose 4, that is a part of Pascal's triangle. Pascal's triangle is loaded with uh, patterns that have been known for millennia, actually. I'm, I mean, there's a, 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 a some sort of a printout at the University of Utah of like a, some Chinese 
version of Pascal's triangle. I guess ancient Chinese mathematicians were aware of Pascal Pascal's triangle and its relationship to things such as the Fibonacci numbers. Um, those fi the Fibonacci numbers being like one, one, two, three, uh, five, eight, and so on. Um, and the Fibonacci numbers have relationships to the golden ratio and blah, 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 blah. There's like a gazillion patterns in this, uh, in this stuff. Uh, there was a famous mathematician who, who, uh, won a, I think it's called the Fields Medal, which is the Nobel Prize for Mathematics. Oh, uh, looks like I'm, my screen is frozen. That's annoying. Um, so he won a Fields Medal and, uh, uh, come on, close the window. The grief. Things you gotta do. All right, so and and he and he said that if the ancient Greeks who were aware of the golden triangle, uh, of the golden ratio, because uh, the Fibonacci numbers are related to the golden ratio, uh, if they had been aware of the normal distribution and that Gaussian curve, uh, good grief! Uh, if they had been aware of it, they would have worshipped it like a god because it's so important in mathematics and it's showing up all over the place. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, all right. So that's kind of the exposition. I hope the video does not freeze as I flip this, but without further ado, let's go ahead and flip this thing. There it is. Check it out. We've got a normal curve superimposed on the beads and the shape that the beads follows looks like a normal distribution. Let's do that again. Unfortunately, there's a glare. Uh, looks like it froze again. There's a glare, unfortunately, from the light that's right behind my laptop. But, well, I mean, you, you're, you're kind of getting the idea. Hopefully, you can see it somewhat well. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, so that's nice. But it goes even further than that. It's more than just a demonstration of the central limit theorem. There's a lot of, like, let's explain for a second what's going on with this Galton board. And what's going on as it travels down the beads? Because it's not just a fun little illustration. Like, what's going on here is rather important in probability theory. The process by which a bead goes from the top to the bottom, if you were to go on in, in probability theory, take more probability classes, uh, such as uh, classes on stochastic processes, uh, stuff like this is, is rather important, right? Um, like, this, this, this board is uh, related to option pricing, in a sense. Uh, option pricing can be seen can be seen in this board, and why options end up being priced the way they do, uh, why they are, has something to do with the way this board is set up. And okay, maybe you don't know what options are. <laughs> I probably should say what options are. Options are a financial instrument. Ugh. I'm getting irritated. Okay, so options are financial instruments. Uh, you have stocks. Or I guess some un underlying financial asset. It, it, it's usually stocks, but it doesn't have to be stocks. And an option is a contract that gives you the right, or let's say this is a call option. It gives you the right to buy the stock at a future date at a certain price. Okay. Is this, is this screen just not going to work? I am getting... Now I'm starting to get really mad. I am getting really mad. Okay, uh, I'm going to try cheese. Because I want to have a webcam going, and this webcam keeps freezing, but it's coronavirus season, so I can't go buy a new webcam because everybody bought out, bought out all the webcams. Because that's how life is right now. Uh, so, fine. Uh, uh, I wonder... Uh, so video, oh, darn it, uh, video, let's try this thing. It, it's lag is longer, unfortunately. It has worse lag, uh, but I don't know. I have a feeling that the problem is the webcam. So I'm just going to try my best, um, and try not to get even more angry. <laughs> so, oh. There it goes. There it freaking goes. 
Okay. I'm getting really mad. So, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm going to go do something else. So I'll, I'll be, I'll be back. Um, I don't know what's going on and someday I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll, I'll be back in a second. Okay, so, okay, right now. Hmm. It's laggy. Part of the reason why things are not working out so well is just because of, like, the fact that I'm recording this at the same time as the camera's going. I wonder if that's it. But whatever, we're, we're, we're going to work with what we got. All right, so I was saying earlier that the Golden Board itself is rather interesting. And the fact that you know how the how this process works is something that probably care a big deal about. Um, how it is that this thing generates movement from the top to the bottom is is um, something that you would revisit later if you were to take more advanced probability classes uh, classes on stochastic processes because the process by which a bead goes from the top of the board down to the bottom of the board is a stochastic process. That process is known as a random walk. And random walks are extremely important in probability. The idea of a random walk is that you have a process that's making uh, tiny movements at each step. And um, like you're, you're walking along, the, it's also kind of called the drunkard's walk or something like that, uh, because uh, you have a position at one step and then you take your next step and for your next step, you're going to like move to the left or move to the right. And you're just going to keep doing this for a while. Um, and that's how your, your position is going to change over time. It's a series of steps and studying how those steps behave is of great interest to probabilists. In fact, here's like two people have made their careers on studying random walks, their entire books about random walks. Here's a book that I picked up uh, in Berkeley, California, uh, on uh, random walks, and uh, I would like to give you a sense of what it is that we're talking about when we're talking about random walks. So I invent, uh, wrote up an R script that is a computational demonstration of the Galton board. So I said the uh, the appeal of a Galton board and, and having and owning a and, and what the fr I restart my computer and now my camera starts freezing up. All right, I'm I'm sick of this. Uh, okay. All right. You, we don't need my camera for a while. Um, the appeal of a Galton board is the phys is how physical it is, but we're going to go to R anyway. Um, so I've written up a script that's trying to, uh, demonstrate how a Galton board is working. I don't know if you can hear the sirens in the background. It's, uh, this is uh, the weekend. This is May 31st of 2020. Uh, if you're wondering why that matters, go look up May 30th, 2020. Uh, if, if this is years in the future and anyone is still alive. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, let's uh, show all the folds in this uh, uh, R script. Okay. So I'm going to kind of demonstrate in R code, what's going on with the Galton board. Uh, so I've got this function plot PMF. You may recall that from some of my R lecture notes. I've got this function RRW that is for uh, generating uh, random walks. And uh, I've got a function plot RW for plotting random walks in a way resembling what's going on with the Galton board. And I've also got HistRW for histograms. Uh, for these random walks. All right. So for this particular board, there are 3,000 beads and 12 rows. In the end, there are 28 bins. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're going to uh, first simulate um, n random walks, uh, and where n is 3,000, and there's going to be 12 rows. So I simulate that. Here's what this. Uh, uh, walks matrix um, looks like so let's do walks uh, 
columns one through uh, five. Okay, so with the random walk, what happens or what what's going on with the Galton board is a bead goes down and it hits a peg, and then it moves either to the left or to the right. We can understand a leftward movement as adding negative one to the current position of the bead and moving to the right as adding plus one to the current position of the bead. Then it hits the next peg and it goes either negative one or one. Negative one to, to move left, one to move right, and so on as it traverses down the board. So it describing this process, we can imagine that actually what we're doing is we're adding up a series of Bernoulli random variables um, are Bernoulli-like random variables, not exactly Bernoulli. Uh, maybe going back to this function RRW, uh, we are adding up, let, let's imagine that we added zero for going to the left and one for going to the right. Then what we would end up doing is adding up um, the num a number of Bernoulli random variables equal to the number of rows in the Galton board. And that would be a binomial random variable. Now, to make it so that you're moving to the left or to the right, just take those Bernoullis, multiply them by two, and then subtract one, and you can confirm for yourself that that corresponds to a random variable that has equal likelihood of going to negative uh, one and equal likelihood of going to one, right? So a Bernoulli-like random variable. And then we add this up. So in the end, the random variable that describes the position of the Galton board, I mean, the position of a bead at the bottom of the Galton board is going to be a binomial random variable, since that's going to be the sum of independent Bernoullis. And uh, so if we want to track the position of a bead as it traverses down the Galton board uh, using random variables, using mathematics, we're just going to be uh, cumulatively, cumulatively adding up these individual random variables, and that will generate a path. It'll generate a path as a bead walks down the board. Okay, and uh, here, so I, so we th we have three thousand beads, so we then have three thousand such paths. Uh, so um, let's go ahead and plot what one of those paths looks like. Okay, so we have. Uh, a f so we had a leftward movement for a while, then it looks like one rightward movement, then leftward movement for a while, then rightward, then leftward, then rightward. Uh, and, and so on. Let's uh, make this master. Okay, so that's one path of a bead. We could go to look at a second bead. There's the path that it took. A third bead, a fourth bead, and so on. And it, so we have a bunch of these paths, and we could plot, say, uh, 10 of these paths. And these are what ten, path, uh, ten what the path of 10 beads looks like as they, tri as they walk down the board. Okay? And when studying random walks, we care not just about the position where a bead ends up at the end of the board, but also the path. We're interested in the path a bead takes as it walks down the board. And when studying random walks, we're we would spend a lot of time talking about that path um, or yeah, because it has a lot of interesting properties, which I'm not going to go into here, but it does. <laughs> right. Um, and it's kind of, and in addition to having a lot of interesting properties, it's kind of this fundamental object. It's an object that forms the basis of other interesting mathematical objects. For example, you can start from random walks and then start uh, talking about, uh, let's say, um, Brownian motion. Brownian motion would be something that you would talk about uh, via the language of random walks or something like that. And uh, if we wanted to, here's all the paths taken. It's going to take a little while because there are 3,000 paths to plot. All right, and uh, I have opacity uh, set so that uh, paths less frequently taken are less opaque, so they're grayer, and paths frequently taken are darker. And you can see that there's a region where uh, paths are very frequently ending up. Uh, here is a histogram of where the of where the beads end up as as uh, at the bottom of the bin with a superimposed normal curve. Uh, each of these bins are centered on the I think the even numbers because yeah, there's a 12 pegs. So so yeah, there basically it's only possible to end up in the even numbers when there's this many pegs. Uh, okay, 
So, uh, and this is where it ends up, and you can kind of tell there's some strange issue going on with, um, like, the normal curb is passing through the corners, uh, but not through the center of the bins, and we would like it to pass through the center of the bins, and I could think about how exactly this should be corrected, and I don't want to. So, <laughs> like, there's just some, that that is an issue, just be aware of that. But it does seem like a normal curve is describing pretty well what's going on with these beads and what would course so what does the central limit theorem say the th central limit theorem would say as we increase the number of pegs um our, our path has to pass through our, our beads have to pass through the better the normal approximation would be so if we were to make this uh let's say 40 yeah let's let's do 40 so and then uh uh run this stuff so here is uh, another path uh, taken by uh, a bead, and uh, we could uh, look at where 10 paths are going. Uh, we could plot uh, all of the paths. And give it a second. All right. Huh, look at that. You can kind of see this, this envelope opening up in principle you could have leftward movement the entire time ending up at negative 40 is not explicitly prohibited but i don't think a path ever reached this point and one thing that you would be interested in if you were studying random walks is where is the envelope that a path is like that would enclose the path right like certainly negative 40 to 40 would enclose the path but what's the smallest envelope that you could put around a path such that it might cross over it a few times, but eventually the path would stop crossing over it. What would that path look like? You can kind of see that there might be one. because And, and that these uh, leftward and rightward movements, there might be something, some lower bound and upper bound that the path will eventually stop crossing. Um, and we can also look at a histogram at the bottom, and now it's looking even more normal. So, all right, um, let's uh, screw around a little bit with uh, this um, plot RW function. I told it to, um, I, I told it explicitly what I want to be the bounds that it plots, but let's take that away. I don't want it to do that anymore. So uh, let's look at walks all right so now it's going to keep a walk within uh its viewport uh and the reason why i want to do that is because i want to go from 40 to let's say 100. hmm it's not as easy to tell well now you kind of can um i think okay i think i'm mostly just not used to what it looks like i'm not used to this uh uh top-down view, which is what's going on in the Galton board, but that's not how I'm used to looking at this. Um, let's, uh, let's remove this line and uh, this line from our plotting function. Okay, and then... Ah, well, this is a weird-looking path. Yeah, that that path's look that, that that path's a little funny, uh, but if we start to increase the number of steps that uh, these beads take as they walk through the board, um, oh yeah, there's that there's that plot. That's that looks really nice. That that looks really nice. Um, what I want to do is increase the number of uh, steps that the bead takes as it walks down the board and it will start to approach a certain shape uh it will start to become oh this is a oh this is a this is a hundred i want a thousand i want a thousand this is going to be trouble Ooh, look at that so this is this, it's taking on some motion you probably think that this motion looks a lot like how stocks behave I mean, a stock is the only thing that you have uh, ever seen before that does up and down motions like these. 
this is one situation where I think that uh, the thickness of the uh, of the line is uh, not to our advantage. So let's delete that. I didn't break anything, did I? No. Well, uh, I want D2. All right. So, yeah, I want to change the, f the thickness. Um, I'm very much experimenting right now um, because I'm, I'm just very curious about this. Yeah, so the path starts to take on this, this shape. And this shape that it starts taking on as we increase the number of steps... And additionally, like the plot is doing this, and we would do this too mathematically, it's reducing the step size. It's making the step sizes even smaller as well. You start getting this weird, this, uh, this path, and the path that you get as you increase the number of steps, while at the same size, decreasing the step size, that's of great interest to probabilists. What you're end ending up with is something known as Brownian motion. And Brownian motion is of interest to a whole bunch of people. Uh, it's of interest to statisticians. It's of interest to uh, probabilists. It's of interest to people who study mathematical finance because they want to use Brownian motion to describe uh, the behavior of stocks. Um, it's of interest to um, physicists. Uh, I think Einstein uh, set out some properties that Brownian motion should satisfy. And uh, someone did, in, sh in fact, show uh, that Brownian motion satisfies those properties. Yeah, this is this is something that, um, and, and in fact, this is a basis of a subject known as stochastic calculus, where you attempt to integrate against a function that looks like this. And in addition, like this function itself has lots of interesting properties. For instance, if you knew you're here in the process, what happens after this point? It looks like it has some shape, some pattern. It might have some predictability, but it doesn't. It doesn't have any predictability at this point. You don't know what it's going to do. In fact, at this point in time, right here, right here where I'm uh, moving my mouse, um, the path essentially restarts and is independent of anything that happened in the past, which should make sense since you know that this path is basically, um, whether it moves up or down, is a sequence of independent heads or tails. So it's not too shocking that you don't know that, and yet it's kind of weird that that is the case. Uh, yeah, this is, um, and uh, there is in fact a, um, an envelope that you can put around the path. Uh, this path goes up to 10, goes down here, and if you could reduce, uh, the, if you could zoom in on this path, let's, it, it, what, what would happen if you were to reduce the step size and increase the number of steps? What you'd end up with is some is some function that is in fact continuous and nowhere differentiable. And if you were to zoom in on this function, as you zoom in, you can't really do it here because this is still up uh, up and down motions. But with Brownian motion, there would be teeny 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 tiny up and down motions, almost infinitesimal up and down motions. And as you zoomed in on Brownian motion. It would just look even more rough, and it would look exactly like it did in the whole screen. It, it, it's just this weird thing that eventually um, that is related to random walks. So and and emerges from random walks. So these things are actually of of uh, great interest to all sorts of individuals, um, which is one reason why I really like introducing this board and talking about it. Uh, I'm gonna try one last time to bring my face up so I'm just going to flip it again one last time so that you can appreciate uh, what is going on wonder what's going on here okay so I'm going to flip it one last time and just think about the fact that you have these beads and they are traveling down uh, paths and they're making little left and right motions and that's a random walk and random walks are extremely interesting and the result of random walks is that if you ask where the position of a bead is along the random walk, the further, the further, the, the longer the random walk has been going on, the more and more the position of the bead will be described by a normal distribution. And that's partly due to the central limit theorem. Well, an expansion of the central limit theorem, but essentially the central limit theorem. 
There we go. All right, so I gave my spiel. It's probably not as good as if I um, actually could show this to people in person, you know, where they could actually touch the board and, you know, flip it, them, uh, flip it themselves, see what happens. Like, for example, if you wanted to experiment with a biased random walk, change uh, the probability that it's being going left and right from one half to maybe one third or something like that, what you would do is tilt the board uh, to change that parameter so you could see what happens. If you were to tilt, oh, the screen froze. Ah, I'm so sick of this. I think I just need to end this stream. Uh, but uh, thank you for watching, and I hope that you learned something, and I might have uh, stimulated your uh, imagination, maybe just a little. All right, bye-bye.